Um, I'm Scott McClellan, and I'm the uh, effectively the CTO for Red Hat at Big Data. We're not officially organized that way, but that's the easiest way to think about my role. I manage the engineering team out of the CTO office that's doing several of the projects that you'll see me talk about today, plus a few others that were presented here that I'm not going to talk about today. Um, been at Red Hat approximately two years, and uh, we're continuing to evolve our overall big data strategy, but you'll get a little insight into it today. We've been working with Hort really closely with Hortonworks for probably two years now, which is how we got um, so involved in Ambari, and you'll see how we're using Ambari with our um, integrated with our Red Hat storage offering. I probably here's basically what I'm going to cover today. I'm going to talk enough about Gluster. Um, how, actually, anybody in the room, anybody used Gluster or know anything about Gluster? So there's a very small, so it's good. I've got to do enough of an overview of what Gluster looks like for you guys to understand that it's a different animal than HDFS. Um, so when you're talking about how we integrate it with, um, uh, with Ambari as our management solution, um, you know, you have to have enough background in it so that it makes sense. So I'm going to talk about that for a little while. I'll, I'll briefly describe the plugin that we've built for our storage solution um, that uh, makes it, um, once it's all set up and configured, makes it look like HDFS. So from, a, from the application point of view, um, that's all transparent, it, but it is relevant in terms of the, the way the, um, the management consoles and stuff are set up. And then I'll talk about how we actually use Ambari. Um, the executive summary would be we're very bullish on the Ambari project. Uh, partly it's in our DNA at Red Hat to like um, open source projects, and this is a pure open source management solution for, um, for Hadoop uh, that makes it possible for our engineers to engage actively in the community, et cetera. So that's a good part of the reason why we're bullish. Um, but the other part is because we've got it, we've integrated it into both our um, current Red Hat storage solution and our will also be integrated with our future storage offerings and it's part of our Red Hat storage, um, or sorry, our, our OpenStack public. Uh, Red Hat's the number one contributor now to OpenStack. Red Hat's plans for productization around OpenStack have to do with us having our own private cloud offering and Re Red Hat built um, along with uh, Morantis and uh, Hortonworks were the original contributors to a project called Sahara, um, which is effectively the Elastic MapReduce equivalent for OpenStack. That was covered in Matt Farley's talk, so I'm not going to get into it in much detail, but um, Bari plays a critical role um, with our OpenStack solution because if you want to run elastically provisioned Hortonworks clusters, in an OpenStack framework and you want to have a familiar console, you can use the Ambari console in front of the Sahara project for all your management, for your setup and teardown of your clusters and for your management of your cluster. Um, so uh, we, have, we will do further integrations with um, Ambari over time. I can see I have a typo there. Um, uh, Red Hat recently acquired a company called Ink Tank, so we have another storage solution called Ceph. How many of you guys are familiar with Ceph, by the way? Eh, same smattering. Um, I'm not going to cover the Ceph integration here because that's still a future project, um, but I will touch here and there on, on how Ceph and Gluster compare to each other and why Red Hat has both storage solutions. But the focus here will be mostly around how Ambari is used as um, a management solution with Red Hat storage. But I would point out that a lot of the issues and benefits that you get from this integration apply to any of the other projects at Red Hat or any other projects that, say, from some other vendor, where they were, if they're thinking about doing integrations with Ambari, they're going to run into some of the same challenges and some of the same benefits. So first of all, just a quick primer. Um, I'll hit a little bit of terminology first. Uh, Red Hat storage refers to a, um, a product from Red Hat. Um, the product from Red Hat has a storage console, Red Hat storage console, the Gluster distributed file system, and Red Hat Enterprise Linux packaged together. So um, all that is is um, a Red Hat supported and Red Hat tested package of those components. Um, Gluster FS refers to the distributed file system technology. 
Gluster.org refers to the upstream developer community for Gluster, and Red Hat Storage is the downstream product. And so that's Red Hat's form for all open source projects is we contribute upstream to the technology, um, do certification, testing, stability, stabilization, et cetera, and turn that into a downstream product. So this is like every other Red Hat product. It's 100% open source based on the upstream product, stabilized and tested. Um, this is not a product talk, so mostly I'll just talk about GlusterFS. Um, a really brief overview, GlusterFS is a scale-out network-attached file system. Um, it's commonly used for storage, very large, storing large quantities of long-tail data. That's relevant because the same kind of data that gets stored in Red Hat storage on a routine basis, uh, semi-static, semi-unstructured or totally unstructured data, is the same kind of data that people often want to do analytics on using something like Hadoop. Um, so the customers that use Red Hat storage are often storing the kind of data you want to do analytics on. And it was originally developed by Gluster Inc., um, which was acquired by Red Hat in 2011. It runs on pure commodity hardware, just like HDFS or any of, or, or a lot of the, uh, or Ceph, which I'll talk about maybe at the end. Um, the whole idea is the same as the idea with Hadoop, which is that you want to use, um, you want to find the economic sweet spot of high volume hardware that um, provides, uh, that is nothing exotic, totally cost effective, that you can get from a variety of vendors. But when you put the software layer on top of it, you get a um, high performance, cost effective, scale out storage solution. So in that regard, it's similar to HDFS. Um, I put some examples of typical hardware, but I'll mention this a little bit more. Um, data is stored as standard Linux files. There's no on-disk format for the um, Gluster file system. Um, it's not exactly like HDFS in that regard, because when you put a file into HDFS, the file gets broken into blocks. The blocks are then distributed around the cluster, so the file is not kept intact as a file. In Gluster, the file is kept intact in file as a file, um, so uh, one of the original design principles of Gluster is that you could remove the Gluster software from the, and, and the, you would have the data would be more or less intact on, on the system. Um, uh, so that's why it doesn't have a custom on-disk format. Um, you, there are clients to access the data via NFS or standard file protocol, Samba or um, SIFS protocol. There's a native higher performance Gluster a uh, file system access client. You can ac access data within Gluster as if it was object storage data using a, a Swift plugin so that it, um, it's compatible with uh, the OpenStack Swift object storage solution. Or with the project that we did, you can access it as a Hadoop file system using the uh, fully implemented Hadoop API. Um, the cluster will run on just about anything. It'll run on typical Hadoop hardware. Uh, that's just an example of an HP box, but this would be a box with like 12 disks. Um, the 2U server typical of a Hadoop deployment. This happens to be HP again, but this would be um, for a dedicated Gluster deployment, you would typically run it on something more like this, uh, just because it has more storage density. So this server would have um, two, two sockets or two x86 processors, but uh, this is a, I think this is the two by 20 configuration, so there's 40 drives here. So. It would, be, it would have less processing power, but much more storage. Um, and if you're um, in, a, in a normal Gluster configuration where you're not doing a lot of data processing on the nodes, this is often the way it's deployed. Um, when you want to form a Gluster cluster, uh, I already said all that stuff, so I'm going to skip that. Um, all nodes in a Gluster cluster are peers. There is no concept of a master and a slave, so that's one of the things that is different you know, when you're setting up and deploying the cluster versus uh, HDFS, which has a master name node and then multiple data nodes. There's no master-slave relationship. Um, any node can be the first to invite other nodes to join the cluster. Once you've been in, um, invited into the cluster, you're a full member, and so you could invite other members, and everybody's a peer. Um, the peering relationships are established by doing simple cluster peer probe with the um, host name of the server you're trying to probe to invite into the cluster. And if you want to check the status, you just do a cluster peer status command. Um, this is not normally the way it's done, but just to give, make my point, you could do a simple for loop um, where 
you just invite the other, you know, you run on node 10, you just invite the other no, um, node one, I'm sorry, you just invite nodes two through 10 to join the cluster with peer probes, wait for it to form, and then you have a cluster. There's nothing special about doing it from node one. Again, they're all peers, so you could do it from any node. That's just the example I used. Um, if you wanted to see if they've actually joined, you do a peer status, and you can see if the stat, once the status has changed to connected, they're full members of the cluster. So that's a little different than the way uh, HDFS node uh, clusters are formed. That's the way they're formed in Gluster. If you had an example of, say, six nodes, just hypothetically, just to keep it simple, and only one volume, um, a volume, I skipped that slide, but a volume is uh, a name uh, for a subset of the namespace. So if you had, I don't know, petabytes of storage, you could carve that storage up into volumes. Um, so you can have multiple volumes within a storage pool. So in this example, I'm saying, let's just say we just had one volume and you only, and a brick is storage with, on a node that's been assigned to a volume. So brick is the combination of physical storage and, and its assignment to a volume. So let's just say you had one brick per node, one volume for the whole trusted storage pool and a total of six nodes and you just had three directories and you had uh, three files in each directory. So I just kept it really simple. Um, if you wanted to create the volume, you would use a Gluster create volume command. You would say um, that you want a replica count of two. That means every file is replicated on some other node. This is actually the typical way uh, Gluster is run, at least in the downstream product form from Red Hat. Typically, nodes would have raid, rated storage, which provides uh, durability, you know, uh, protection against a disk failure, and then they would do two-way replication to protect against a server failure, which is a bit different than typical for Hadoop. Typically, Hadoop would be no RAID with three-way replication. Um, there's nothing about Gluster that says you can't do JBOD and three-way configure uh, replication if you want to, but the way we productize it from Red Hat at the moment is uh, two-way replicated with RAID. Um, but that's not inherent in Gluster, that's a product choice. Anyway, if you wanted to form a volume, you would do a command like this. And here you can see implicitly are the brick, uh, node one, brick one is paired with node two, brick two. You know, since the replica count is two, every two in a row form a tuple. And that means that's the peering relationships. So you'd end up with um, three pairs of two with that volume command. Anyway, um, that's the way you form volumes. Um, in this example, if you had these six nodes, one volume, one brick per volume, if you, um, you know, you would end up with every directory appears uh, on every node. So like I said, there was only directory one, two, and three. So you'll see directory one, dr directory two, and directory three are on all the nodes. But all the files are not on all the nodes. There's an elastic hashing algorithm that decides which nodes get which files. And again, data is persisted as a full file, not broken up into blocks. So in this silly little example, just to make my point, if you had three files per directory, directory one, you might randomly end up with file one and file three on this pair, uh, file two on this pair, and um, directory ones um, didn't get any files. None of their files happened to end up on this pair. And over a large number of files, the elastic algorithm will spread the data very evenly and it will take into account storage, et cetera, so you get an even distribution. That's the way it works. Um, you can read this if you want, but the main points are the data is not kept in some database um, for the elastic hashing. The data is kept in the um, extended attributes area uh, that, of the file system itself. So um, the underlying file system, physical file system, Linux physical file system could be any Linux physical file system that supports the extended attributes. Red Hat storage uses XFS. Um, there's upstream testing on BTRFS and there's, it's popular to deploy it using EXT3 because all of those support extended attributes. But the, there is not some database someplace that has all the metadata about file locations. That data is actually kept uh, in the extended attributes area off of the directory, and the directory acts as a B tree hash, um, and that means that all of the directory entries have to be repeated on all nodes, which can make um, lots of small metadata operations are more expensive in Gluster than they are in HDFS. Does, 
because that's kept in a, you know, that's a relatively cheap operation in HDFS. Um, I think that's the main things I wanted to say about this. You guys, I'll put the slides up, you could read them. Gluster has the uh, concept of a translator. This is kind of the key mechanism in Gluster. Um, and uh, translators are, are deliberately broken down into the, a simple operation. So a translator never does anything more than one thing. Uh, it might just persist the data, or it might do the read ahead caching or the write behind caching, or it might implement fault injection, or it, but translators never do, or they may do replication. Translators never do a combination of things. They do a, one simple operation. And the way you get the behavior of any volume is by st how you stack up the translators. So Gluster is therefore very flexible. Um, does that make sense to you guys? Um, I don't want to, this is not meant to be a Gluster internals, but uh, you can see like from the client, you might get a, a um, come in like this and you might get a translator stack that looks something like this where you have debugging and IO stats are captured by this translator. Uh, performance stat prefetching, quick read, IO cache, read ahead, right behind, um, and then you get to the protocol, uh, client side protocol, which is going to um, potentially do an RPC or is going to do an RPC over to the server side of the stack, and then you get like more debugging, marker framework, performance enhancements for threads, specific stuff for locking, access control, and then finally it's persisted in storage. And one interest, just to highlight how versatile Gluster is, theoretically, the storage underneath this could be something like um, a Berkeley database, a BDB database, it could be Cassandra, it could be MongoDB. You would just have to replace the bottom translator with something that's persisting the data, the final data in something other than a POSIX file system. And, and that's, you know, so there's people that have done really creative things with the way they compose and write custom translators and stuff, but I'm not trying to get into all that today. Okay, so we've created a Hadoop plugin, and the way it works is almost exactly like the raw local file system plugin for Hadoop itself works. So, I mean, Hadoop has had the raw local file system plugin forever, um, or I don't know about forever, but for as long as I've paid any attention to Hadoop. And um, basically, if you want to run Hadoop on a single node and persist the data in your local file system, um, and, and you don't have HDFS as the backing storage, then, um, then the raw local file system translator is taking all the raw Hadoop API calls and doing the, the appropriate thing for like a, um, a write or a read to the local file system. So what we do is we literally start with the raw local file system and extend it with um, a few things that are specific for Gluster. So one example of something that we have to do in our plugin that it makes it, that's an extension, is if you wanna figure out the, the locality hint. So Gluster has an API called um, Get block location, I believe is the name of the API that the scheduler calls to figure out, sorry, Gluster doesn't have that, Hadoop has that. They have a get block location API call that will look up where a specific block is for the input split on a map job, and then it, that, that'll be a hint back to the scheduler as to where to schedule the data. Well, what we do is we um, put an extension in there that will call the appropriate um, API and Gluster to look up where in the cluster cluster the data is so it can provide that hint back to the, um, the scheduler. And, there, and so it turns out that our entire Hadoop plugin is based off of the standard Apache raw local file system plugin with a very small amount of specific code for Gluster. So the, it's a very tidy piece of code. That's the bottom line. Um, and with that, you get pretty much a full, fully, full implementation of the Hadoop API. About the only thing we don't implement is there's an API called set, set replication factor, which would allow you to specify how many copies of data to make on a per file basis. And replication in Gluster is a per volume attribute, so that it's impossible for us to implement that API. So that API turns into a no-op. Um, but the rest of the APIs are all implemented. Okay, so if we contrast it a little bit, um, we're all peers, HDFS is master-slave, primary access to data is via the Hadoop API, we, um, Gluster is more general purpose, supports all these other access protocols, 
uh, data is broken into blocks and scattered around the cluster it, with the blocks being replicated here. Data is, files are stored as files and they're not blocked. Um, there is an upstream translator called, uh, that does striping that, um, th that will let a file span multiple nodes and be striped across nodes, but it's not the same semantics as blocking in Hadoop. So, uh, and we're not currently productizing it in Red Hat storage, but it does exist within Gluster. Metadata is centralized in a name node, um, and the name node can have HA. Uh, in Gluster, uh, it's decentralized, and there's a very small amount of metadata, and it's kept in the extension area. Uh, metadata operations are relatively inexpensive, but that puts a tax on the name node in, in um, Hadoop. They're relatively expensive in Gluster, but the tax is distributed, so the effect of metadata is different. Um, replication, you can set on a per file basis. Here, it's per volume. Uh, Gluster or Hadoop tends to use eventual consistency for block replication um, unless you do the hsync or hflush API calls. Um, Gluster is always strictly consistent. So when you net all that out, um, all of the workloads run transparently on top of Gluster. Um, HDFS is purpose built for running MapReduce workloads, uh, and so it works fabulously. Uh, it's a super scalable. Um, Gluster is a uh, more well-rounded general purpose storage solution. So it's a place you could uh, put lots of data, um, any of your data. It's, it's a suitable NFS alternative, et cetera. Um, we tr so we're trading a small amount of performance and some total scalability for more flexibility, basically, when, you're, when you use um, Gluster in place of HDFS. And, there is anywhere, we're still characterizing performance, to be honest, but we find the performance to be on par to a 30 or so percent hit relative to Hadoop. There's a couple outliers where we haven't tuned away that are worse than that. But in general, um, it's probably in this range, and the goal is to shrink this range over time. We have a whole bunch of stuff planned on the roadmap that will uh, eliminate or uh, shrink the, um, road, uh, the performance overhead. Um, this is probably more than we need to cover because I want to get to the Ambari part of the topic. Um, but real quickly, there are um, Hadoop likes really huge files because if you take a bunch of log files, for example, and um, flume them together into a giant file, you get the uh, you minimize the amount of entries, uh, the the name name node overhead, and you maximize the benefit you get from the blocking. Basically, um, Gluster kind of works a little bit different. The truth is, is that you would have probably been better off not putting all those files into one giant file um, because uh, those files are, will not be scattered around the cluster as effectively as they would have been in HDFS. So there are some subtle differences like that. Um, we, we will um, use the native cluster API in a future which gets rid of the fuse mount overhead and we'll put blocking in and uh, blocking in in the future to deal with the two things I just said. Um, and uh, since you're combining compute and storage, an HDFS node um, often uh, will, the Gluster itself doesn't require hardly any CPU to implement its protocol. So it can typically have a um, live with less CPU and, and more storage. Um, when you put Hadoop on it, you would want to put it on more like a typical Hadoop node. Does that kind of make sense to folks? Um, and I just want to emphasize that it's not a goal for Red Hat to, to run around and, and say HDFS is bad and Gluster is good. I mean, they're both good for, they're good for different things. Um, a funny story was back in 2013 when we started our collaboration with Hortonworks on this specific project. The register, who likes to stir up trouble, put out an article that said Red Hat was going to kick HDFS to the curb with Gluster, and we all laughed about it because that isn't our goal at all. In fact, we started a project upstream called Hadoop Compatible File System Project, part of Apache Hadoop, which is just a bunch of tests that validate what the semantics of all the Hadoop APIs are, which are just as useful to the Hadoop community as they are to us. Our goal is to be compatible and get along, not to be competitive and disparaging about HDFS. Um, really, the I, I'm not even going to bother with that because that's more of a product thing. So let's talk about how um, um, Bari fits into the picture. Um, 
So Ambari's role, that what we use it for, is we use it to deploy and configure, and that should say monitor, not monitory. I don't know what that word is, but anyway. Um, deploy, configure, and monitor Hadoop as usual. That's what Ambari's role is in any situation is to um, deploy, configure, and monitor Hadoop. And when you're running Hadoop on Red Hat Storage, it has the same role. Normally, however, um, Umbari would be the tool that's used to deploy uh, both the storage part of the Hadoop stack and all the services that sit that are co-deployed on top of storage. So Umbari would do both halves of the deployment. In the case of Red Hat Storage, um, it's assumed that Gluster has already been provisioned and deployed. So in other words, we didn't make changes to Ambari to be able to provision Gluster. The assumption is that it's already deployed, and then it just provisions all the Hadoop services on top of Gluster. Does that make sense? So it's only doing part of its normal task. And the high-level sequence that you use for setting things up is you would install and configure Red Hat storage no using normal Red Hat. This is uh, I put a little asterisk here that this is the flow for our high-touch beta. Um, this flow is changing in subtle ways that aren't germane to this discussion for our GA. And this is kind of a specific order if you wanted to run Hortonworks HDP on top of Red Hat storage. Um, so there's a couple of Red Hat storage-isms and, Hado and Hortonworks-isms in here, but the flow would be basically the same if it were Apache Hadoop on Gluster FS. Um, anyway, you would install the underlying storage solution um, using the normal mechanism. Um, you would create and configure whatever volumes you wanted. Um, and there are some settings that you want to, to use on your volume and disk configuration to make sure that Hadoop will work correctly. Gluster um, can, uh, has some performance settings that will relax namespace consistency in a way that's inconsistent with the namespace consistency guarantees that Hadoop wants. Um, and so if you uh, turn on too many Gluster performance options and relax namespace consistency too much, you can get file not found errors out of Hadoop um, because of race conditions. So one of the things that would happen here is we make sure that those settings are set in ways that the Hadoop jobs will still run in this step. Um, then you would install and configure Apache Umbari and you do that pretty much the way you always install and configure Apache Umbari. Then you would deploy, then you would use Apache, Apache Umbari to deploy the HDP stack. And I'll show you slide shots for that part. Um, then um, this is way too complicated of a topic to even attempt to take on here, but uh, the HDFS had, uh, or Hadoop has support for this thing called the Linux Container Executor, um, which is a feature that we use in order to implement our multi-tenancy and our security model. It's been uh, um, partially deprecated and we've had to change our implementation slightly, so this is slightly dated and it's a complicated topic. Um, but anyway, once you've done all this, then you just use Hadoop normally. Um, so before I show you the screenshots, I wanna just say up front that this is the current way we have Hadoop integrated with, or uh, sorry, Ambari in integrated with our solution. It's definitely possible to simplify this because as you can see, what we're really doing is this is, uh, you know, this is a step, this is a step, this is a step, and, they, and these all end up discrete chapters in an installation guide. The truth is, is we can drive all of this programmatically from, um, any, from either an a install type tool or a, a shell script because, um, because Ambari has a REST interface and a Python CLI, a Python interface and a CLI. Um, all, any of those plus the new Ambari blueprint technology would allow us to, to drive much more automation into this installation sequence. So all these manual steps you have to do in the Ambari um, to configure things could be all driven in an automated way. And that is the direction we'll go in the future. But anyway, with the current state of the art, this is kind of the, what we're, I'm showing you is for this step, this is how Ambari is used. You would just sign in to Ambari as normal. Um, you would give your customs cluster some name. People that did the screenshot decided it was called Awesome, awesome Cluster. Um, you would, then the next step as you work your way down the, the set of steps on the side is to select the stack that you want to deploy. Um, because of the way Ambari is set up on um, when you when we follow the instructions to set it to install it, 
this stack will be visible called um, HDP 2.0.6.glusterfs. If you um, normal Hadoop, uh, Hortonworks Hadoop users wouldn't see this option because they're deploying on HDFS and we didn't want them to be confused about what the heck is Gluster if they don't own Gluster. So this basically only shows up if you are a Gluster customer. If it's there, you can pick it. Um, then this is all normal stuff that you would always do in Ambari. You have to enter in the, the node names for all your nodes in your cluster and pick the register and confirm button down here. Um, now, right now, you would have to ignore the warnings that it's going to then spit out. Um, all of these warnings are, are caused by things that have already been addressed. So um, for we're doing our QE testing um, for the 2.0.6, which is the 1.4.4 version of Ambari. Um, there's a whole bunch of changes that we've got in the 1.5 and 1.6 versions of Ambari um, that um, cause all of these warnings to go away so they aren't bothering the end user. But um, if you happen to be trying it with 2.0.6 and 1.4.4, you'll get a warning, you'll get a couple of warnings that you have to okay and our install guide tells you to do that. Um, and then you'll get the normal Ambari progress th where these little bars are growing as the, all the bits are getting installed onto the nodes properly. Um, and then when that's done, you can next to the next screen. Um, because there are those earlier warnings, you'll have to say you're okay with that. Um, again, this whole thing goes away um, on the 2.1 um, and 1.6 versions of um, Hortonworks and Ambari but they exist on the version that we're showing here. Then you just pick what services you want to install. So here you can see you have HDFS as an option and Gluster. So we don't remove HDFS. If you wanted to install HDFS on, on these Gluster nodes, you could. But we do make this a mutually exclusive choice for now. Um, in the future, we're going to look at how you could um, have both HDFS and Gluster coexisting in a single namespace so that you didn't have to, um, so this more of a federated namespace, but in this version, you pick one or the other, um, and it will enforce that that's a binary choice. Then you can pick all the other services you wanted to install, which are Nagios and Ganglia and Hive and HCAT and all the stuff you would normally see. And um, then you, the, everything from there on out is the same as you always would do, so I didn't bother with screenshots you pick. You assign your masters, you assign your clients. Actually, it's not quite everything is the same. Um, and then the last step is it gives you an option to do some custom settings. And there, and we document what these are, but I didn't want to put in all the little screenshots for all the little custom settings. But basically what you're doing is you're spec specifying the correct mount points and the correct names for the staging directories, the locations for the staging directories, and a few properties that are used by our Hadoop plugin um, that are put into the uh, you know, everything that's in your core side XML file put, it goes into a database. It can be all read from Java, using Java API calls, and our Hadoop plugin is written in Java. So we put some properties in there that our, our plugin can reference. Um, and uh, that's all documented. But I, now this, so you, you basically, you can see from this what my point is, which is in, um, in the future, we can take away the need to do all these manual configuration steps, still use Ambari, but drive all this through the um, REST. Well, we have multiple choices through REST, through the Python interface, or through the CLI, and or using a combination of the Ambari blueprint. So we have several op uh, options that combined will allow us to take away all the manual steps in the middle of this. But at the end of the day, what you end up with is, let's say, a Hortonworks customer that's, um, and Hortonworks is driving um, their customers toward, uh, you know, everybody uses Ambari. I don't think 100% of Hortonworks customers today use Ambari, but that's, it's been trending up. I don't have the statistics because I don't work for Hortonworks. But Hortonworks customer experience is increasingly to use Ambari. Ambari has been um, modified to work the same once you get through these um, not yet automated installation steps for a customer using Hortonworks on, um, HDP on top of Red Hat storage. A couple things I wanted to say is Ceph, which would turn into a whole nother discussion, um, has a plugin interface that supports HDFS and so does Swift. Um, between Ceft, Ceft, Swift, Ceph, and Gluster, Red Hat has a complete 
portfolio of storage solutions that give you uh, OpenStack object storage, um, Ceph, Ceph and Gluster can both do object file and block storage. Ceph is um, being featured as our block storage solution. Um, so when you're doing an OpenStack private cloud, the Ceph is the dominant storage solution to put behind the Cinder interface, which would give you block storage for your private cloud solution. And um, Gluster is uh, um, being featured from Red Hat as our premier file service. So we have um, both of those can do it all, but uh, uh, our most mature file solution is um, Gluster. Our most mature block and object storage is uh, uh, Ceph, and the OpenStack specific project is Swift. So we, and all of those have, um, all of those have uh, full Hadoop APIs, and all of those can run Hadoop jobs. So increasingly, the direction we're going is to be able to make um, OpenStack a first-class platform for doing data processing. And as part of that, there's the project that I mentioned earlier called Savannah that Matt's talk was about, which was is, our, is an OpenStack answer to Elastic MapReduce. It allows you to elastically provision clusters in an OpenStack framework. Um, it gives you flexibility about where the, the persistent storage for those clusters are. And um, it, in addition to being able to elastically provision a cluster, it can actually also do uh, workload management. So if you, instead of setting up a cluster and then running multiple jobs, if you just wanted to run a job through Sahara, you could specify you just want to run the job. It would, um, you specify the rules for where the data are, uh, for the job are is coming from and where it's supposed to be persisted and what jar file is the job itself. And basically it would set up the cluster, do all the wiring of all the storage, run the job, and then tear the cluster down, persist the data. So if you just want to run a job, you can use the Elastic Data Processing feature in, um, and otherwise you can, use, uh, you can use it to set up a long-lived cluster. Let's see, um, and my last comment pretty much is that I feel like Umbari has come a long ways, uh, you know, from where it was a year and a half ago. Um, it's quite strong for, de for deployment and configuration management. It still has a long ways to go in, in terms of monitoring of live clusters and, um, and management of live clusters. I mean, that functionality is continuing to improve, but I, I, think it, you know, I think people would probably agree that's where a lot of the emphasis in the future for Umbari will go. And increasingly, um, we're, we're kind of weaving the Umbari into all of Red Hat's strategies. Um, and Red Hat is now the number two contributor to Umbari, and that's a lot of the places where Red Hat would like to, to contribute, is to improving the um, management of live clusters, and, as well as making sure it works well with all of our projects. So that's all I had for today. So we've got time for a few questions, if you guys have any, but that's it. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Or did I go so fast I confused you all to death? Okay, well thank you.